Uh, what is it that you like about Pete Buttigieg? Well, I like the fact that he's a moderate. I like how he speaks. I like how he's not overly dramatic when he approaches certain conversations with people. Because I think like that's like the big turnoff to a lot of the Democratic politicians nowadays is that some of them can just be a little overly dramatic. A lot of them don't have like a firm, you know, understanding of the policy that are, you know, goes on behind some of these, you know, issues nowadays. <laughs> Like, I know some people are really big about Bernie. I'm definitely not a Bernie fan, not feeling the burn over here in California. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just, I'm not a big fan of, like, you know, how people approach the topic of universal health care, how they approach, like, a lot of these conversations, you know, okay, when it comes so to the defense budget, for getting student loans. Like, Pete, there's just so much. Yeah. Pete, but, oh my gosh. Wow. Okay, let's start with one of those. Us. Uh, Universal student healthcare. Loans? What? It, no, let's see. Universal okay. <laughs> what is it that you don't uh, like about people's rhetoric with universal healthcare? Do you not support like Medicare for all? So, I do support Medicare for all. It's just that you know it's kind of going to be like a very hard transition. Well, universal healthcare is something that really can't just be you know done overnight. It's definitely a transition. Um, we've seen a lot of success in it over in Europe, especially when we have like these smaller countries that can do it with a much smaller population. When we're talking about the United States, which is literally sometimes like 30 to 40 times bigger than some of these countries, it's a little bit harder to make those adjustments, especially since our demographics are very different over here. Um, my big issue with making that transition is that there's just going to be a lot of jobs lost. Like There's going to be a huge hiccup in the insurance industry. There's going to be a huge hiccup in the medical industry. And, you know, when it comes to medical devices, like this economy is very intricate. It's very complicated. So it's not something that can really just happen overnight. So mm -hmm. I'm, I like... Here's a question. I do, so, yeah, go for it. Uh, Medicare is super popular, seems to be generally effective. Um, what would you feel about like each year the age of medicare goes down 10 years until everyone's covered so that the yeah. the system can adjust yeah i think that it would be a, a great plan i just think that we need to start doing it in smaller markets like maybe have some of the states start branching out and doing it on their own um, I would love to see, you know, maybe in Hawaii or Seattle. I know California's been talking about doing like a trial run for for years, but it just keeps getting voted down in the um, California Assembly. But I would like to see it done on a much smaller market. Just do some market tests, just to see how it transitions. But the, just, but what you said just a second ago is that it the places that we reference as being successful are smaller markets. So we already have smaller markets to reference. Exactly. That's why I, I want to see it, you know, start being like, you know, implemented in smaller markets. Cause a lot of times when Bernie goes in or, you know, when we see him in the debates, we see Elizabeth Warren, it's like an all or nothing kind of conversation, especially when right now, when we have a very divisive political environment, we have like the Donald Trumps of the world ready to throw mud at anything that, you know, that seems like socialism we need to be very careful about how we approach these conversations with people. Cause even though like I do tr trust me, I'm a very liberal Democrat. I do support, you know, universal healthcare, but it's the messaging that I have an issue with because at the same time I used to live in Alabama. That's where I grew up. I grew up in the South. I know how people's preconceived notions of socialism affect their politics. And so it's going to be a very difficult message to sell because before you can even, you know, implement any of these policies, you have to get elected. You have to be electable. That's the issue with Bernie. He's just not electable. Yeah, he appeals to like, you know, like the 30% of Democrats that are super progressive. But when you put him out there against, you know, a lot of these moderate Republicans, moderate Democrats, he tends to lose. Hence the reason he lost against Joe Biden. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, there's definitely a, there's said, definitely like a um Bernie's too radical narrative, but I just don't know how much of that is grounded in actual public opinion. I mean, okay, wait, it is public opinion, obviously, because people vote that way, but um, in people's views on his positions or people's just vibe based on his uh, aesthetic in the media, because one of the things that was seen is a lot of like super, super conservative voters um, ended up liking him a lot 
because he seemed anti-establishment. There's a really big like anti-establishment move right now. And so, I don't know, to me, if somebody came along and didn't allow themselves to ever, you know, catch the label of radical socialist or whatever, even though they'll be called that, if like, what are you talking about? I don't think my policies are radical. Whereas I feel like uh, Bernie leaned into it, like he called himself a democratic socialist and he uh, wouldn't really push back when called certain things uh, because his actual positions aren't so radical. And like you thought Pete Buttigieg was moderate. And his whole healthcare plan was Medicare for all who wants it, which is like Medicare for all, but just harder to get done because you don't have a uh, expected pool of, you know, insure insurees. And so that's something that would, I don't think really ever happen, but, uh, well, I think there's like, he just a had lot the aesthetic. There's a lot of like people think people yeah. are moderate because of aesthetics and not actually because their policies are more radical. Uh, yes and no. Like, I when Bernie released his budget, there was like a six trillion dollar difference from the amount of money that he would bring in to the amount of money that he was spending. So, like, you could find six trillion dollars so easy in taxes. Oh, Here's really? Why, I, I, I'll tell you why. It's like too. the current national budget. So, like, you would have to, you know, at least double the national budget to meet that. So, I'll tell you right now. Mm-hmm. One of the things he's not allowed to say is that he he would just generally raise taxes. Now, there is so much tax not being paid like without even raising the rates there's just so much tax not being paid by the um top echelon of society and you could get so much there but then also like if people are saving thousands of dollars on insurance you know one of the things my brother pointed out to me was that nordic countries that we reference a lot like do tax the middle class more and while there's probably a way you could do it without raising the taxes on the middle class like there's actually a cost benefit analysis that could be done. That's like, Oh, you raise taxes a little bit on everybody except for like the poorest. And they save thousands of dollars on insu- on a uh, health insurance. Yeah. Well, like that's the other thing that we have to remember about these Nordic countries is that their economies are structured very, very differently. Like when we're talking about Finland, Sweden, you know, a lot of like, there's a lot of oil producing, what's the word I'm looking for? Oil refinement that comes out of those countries. So they actually have a net export. So it makes it much more financially viable for them to have these types of, you know, <laughs> government programs because they can fund it that way. But then you go a little bit south to South Europe where a lot of these countries actually have to import a lot of their goods. They're not exporting. They're not actually making money. But they're actually trying to implement these universal health care programs and you're seeing them go bankrupt. So it's kind of – you have to do it with the money being right. You know, like I like the idea of universal health care, but it has to be done in a way that, you know, it's financially and economically viable. Bernie, unfortunately, he's a psych major, you know, he never really he doesn't have a very good understanding of economics, which is why the, you know, the (laughs) excuse me, that's why the budget that he put forward had a six trillion dollar miss. And that was from the corporate budget or corporate congressional budget office that actually did the analysis on that plan. But they're notorious for under uh undercounting. But again, I'm not really that concerned. And I'm also, especially when you're spending it in areas that he would be spending it, to deficit spend that type of money, not six trillion, but you would raise a little bit more taxes and then deficit spend and go, you know, a couple trillion in debt each year that's just not that's not even a big problem like a lot more people have gotten on board with modern monetary theory which shows us if you spend money in places that causes uh growth in the economy and you grow the economy you know in a reasonable kind of scale compared to inflation then you're actually just doing good like the fear mongering about having the debt and deficit and all that type of stuff is just way overblown so even if he didn't pay for everything and it was spent in a deficit like that doesn't bother me at all Uh, somebody said bernie's a social democrat not a democratic socialist well bernie has called himself a democratic socialist yeah it's not the same thing but uh bernie has called himself a democratic socialist uh but i think claudia you're thinking that his policies are all social democratic like a democratic socialist would i think it's because bernie does believe in like democracy in the workplace which would make him an actual socialist um Whereas social Democrats just want like more safety nets and stuff like that. Well, well, that's, that's the difference there. Well, cause there really isn't a difference by switching the two words. Cause socialism is a type of economy. D- democracy is a type of government. 
Like they're very different. You can have one or the well, other. They're not yeah. mutually exclusive. Well, the reason why so, people put those well, social democrat just refers to like, um, pretty much. It's just like an in my, from my knowledge, it's a newer term that's just more to say like, hey, I'm a I'm a democrat, but I'm like on the left edge of the Democratic Party. Um, whereas a democratic socialist is just saying that I want to enact socialism, but not through authoritarian means. That's why you tack the democratic thing to it. Um, I'm not a socialist myself, but that's my understanding like a lot of social or some socialists want more of like a ussr or yeah that type of or like, like china or, or even, china right yeah even the nazis consider themselves socialists so whereas yeah democratic yeah. socialists are like we want to do this all through democracy and uh still have an emphasis on individual rights and stuff like that yeah and like just to kind of bring it back on topic here you know yeah, do I think it's a great policy idea, universal health care? Yes, but it's how we approach it, it's how it's implemented. Because before we can even implement universal health care, we got to get these guys elected first. Problem is, half the country doesn't want it. So how do we sell them on it? And we have to take it one step at a time. So there's plenty of things, like plenty of regulations we can put into place right now that can start help easing, you know, this cycle. Because even then, if we look at, you know, how much debt there is in the United States... The majority of that debt is held in medical debt, not even in student loans, which is still pretty big. We'll get to that topic in a minute. But, <laughs> excuse me, Nathan and I are still getting over a cold, so please forgive me. Aww. But, um, yeah, so the majority of the debt in this country is medical debt. And the thing is, when we look at, you know, all this medical spending in the United States, what are we spending that money on? You know, a lot of these hospitals, a lot of these dental offices – about more than half their budget is dedicated to paying their doctors, paying their employees, a little bit more than half their budget, actually. So let's see here. Why do we have to pay these employees so much? Maybe because going to medical school will cost like half a million dollars. Yeah, but like, there's a Medicare lot of things for all is can... just universal health insurance. So you're, you would still well, yeah, be paying well, them big bucks. Well, that's the thing. Like, There's a lot of things we can look at because if you go to these universal health care, you know, countries they have universal college so these doctors are not spending half a million dollars to go become doctors mm -hmm. so they don't have to make you know all this money when they become doctors so taking that out of the equation working the economics backwards kind of reverse engineering it that's why a lot of this can be somewhat successful is because if you start with you know education if you start with universal college <laughs> You start with, you know, scholarships for doctors, scholarships for lawyers, scholarship for teachers. We can start to lower healthcare costs right off the bat. We can start taking that away. We can start making it a little bit more manageable. So when it does come time to transition to universal healthcare system, it's a lot more manageable. We can do it a little bit more quickly. Because the right now the main concern with the majority of the country, which is why a lot of these guys are not getting elected to begin with, is because they're scared of how it's gonna affect the economy. Because at the end of the day, we can't do this overnight. It's going to be a 5, 10, 15-year adjustment where we might lose some jobs before we start seeing the economic benefit. So <laughs> uh, I love that you're, yes, uh, your boyfriend's chatting. That's hilarious. Um, I'm in the other room, so, so I can't see. It's but. awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah. he, here's the deal. I, I am not in like real debate mode, so I'm not going like, to do my rapid fire. But um, definitely... As Andrew said, a lot of this, he said, I have friends in the medical field and what your friend Austin is saying is not accurate. I think you're missing out on, I agree there would be a transitionary period. Um, as crazy as it sounds, the government's actually been pretty effective at um, rolling out massive programs in the past. I mean, we see, even you think about Medicare and Social Security with less technology than we have now, and it's they're the most popular uh, programs in the country. And... You also save, from the economy point of view, you save so much money. Someone put in the chat, 20 to 30 percent uh, employers would have 20 to 30 percent more capital per year because uh, they're not having to pay their employ you know, employees health insurance. And then all of the administration costs that it takes because these gazillions of insurance companies are negotiating with the hospitals and um, you have to have all these staff members and huge, huge, huge billions of dollars spent on um, managing that. But if you had one, you know, single payer, then those costs go way down. And I, like I said, I definitely agree. It's going to be a huge transition, but 
my my idea has always been you just drop the Medicare age, drop and drop and drop until everyone's covered. And there's all these externalities that are actually really beneficial. And then of course, like you, you were talking about jobs. I think I looked up and like a million people are in the in- insurance industry. So you're going to have to be thinking, I thought I blocked the sexy chat thing. <laughs> um, uh, you're going to have a lot of jobs lost and you're going to have to account for that as well. But overall, that's definitely worth the thousands of dollars in everyone's pockets each year. Like you said, no one's ha- going to have to file for medical bankruptcy bankruptcy. You have all this money back in the economy because employers are saving money that they would be spending on their employees insurance. Um, and we've seen it work for everybody 65 and up. And that's the hardest population to take care of. They have the most, uh, you know, preexisting conditions. So it's only going to get easier and easier and less expensive as we go down younger and younger. Yeah. And I can see that. It's just that like, you know, Medicare for all, especially because like, again, I work in the dental industry. So like when I look at Medicare from a dental aspect, they don't cover a whole lot, you know? So a lot of these seniors are still coming and having to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for their work, you know? So it's not like the government's actually paying anything towards these programs. So it's like, I, I can see but what, where you're dental coming stuff, from, but like, right? I know, but dental is healthcare, though. You well, know? no, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, one of the things that Biden was trying to do and failed was expand Medicare to dental, hearing, and vision, and I'm definitely for that, but I, Nate, why did Austin activate the sexy chat bots? <laughs> Someone said, or Jared said. Uh, so, I think, I mean, worst case scenario, yeah, everything's covered except dental which i agree that is health care which is stupid that it's not covered which it would be under medicare uh, under bernie's plan uh but then i am totally fine with like and i guess this is taking a little bit out of pete Buttigieg's book like you know everyone's covered on medicare and then if you want extra stuff if you want like a bougie dental surgery that's gonna that's not really necessary for you to use your teeth it's just to make them look all nice and bougie um mm-hmm. then you have to pay out of pocket or you have to get a extra on you know added layer of insurance and just like how people do with medicare now you have medicare and you have the medicare extensions or whatever they call them expansions uh where people have extra stuff for the kind of the the gold plan and i think that's perfectly fine like you have yeah you know you would still have some insurance companies that maybe executives they get like the medicare expansions that their company pays for and extra whatever they want and like that's all fine but no one's gonna have to go in and get a necessary surgery and pay for it yeah, and it's, you know, I'm not going to argue against, you know, the universal health care, Medicare for all plan. Because at the end of the day, I do support these policies. It's just that it's the messaging of it that we have to tackle. Because, mm-hmm. like, again, I don't really think Bernie, you know, is the right messenger for it. Yeah, he yeah he can get people hyped up and get people inspired. But at the end of the day, he scares off about half the country. So that's what we have to do. We have to at least nominate a, you know... A presidential candidate that can speak to the other half, relate to them, bring them on board. And who is this other half you're a, talking about? Oh, the other half. Like I'm talking about, like the more conservative half of the country. But we don't need them. feel alienated. We don't have to convince. We don't have to get a single Republican vote. What we need is for more like moderate liberals to be on board. Because the, the, well, there's there's like way way more liberals in the country than conservatives. It's just they don't well, get out to vote. Excuse me. Well, here, well, that's I kind of disagree with you on that point because, like, even then, if you look at the last two elections, right? You know, mm-hmm. they they're very the, the margin of error is very very small from where you know Trump beat Hillary Clinton to where Joe Biden beat Trump. You know what comes up in the next four years? If you're that margin like, of error could slip a little bit electorally. So it, because of the electoral college, we're split. Yes, but if you're talking about the country as a whole, like Biden, I mean, uh, Democrats blow out Republicans every single presidential election except for one Bush election in the last eight elections. Yes, yeah, in the yeah, in, in the, the popular, popular vote. vote. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but at the I hate to say it, at the end of the day, does that really matter? No, because <laughs> does that yeah, actually? It doesn't matter. But the point that I'm making yeah. is that we have we have the, enough people who are left of center to win every election. Uh, until the end of time not the end of time you know things could change but as of now we could win every election it's just not all of those voters either get out to vote or would be willing to support bernie or someone like well here's the thing if they haven't gone out to vote after the past two elections then you're betting you're i don't think you should be holding your breath 
Because, like, if you've seen Donald Trump, you see how that man, you know, interacts with people, the, you know, kind of condescending rhetoric he uses, divisive rhetoric, how he, after January 6th, you know, and you're still haven't gone out and, you know, I don't know. I just don't think that, like, people who've seen 2016 and 2020, if neither one of those elections have motivated them to vote, they're not going to, nothing going forward is going to motivate them. So, <clears throat> don't so, you agree that, least, like, uh, Hillary was one of the most hated candidates in a long time. She definitely was, but unfortunately the past two elections have been about like, who do we hate more Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? Right. So don't you, think that, Biden. don't you think that dynamic, it, it's natural that that would lead to uh, people not going out to vote. If it's just, who do you hate more? Um, not necessarily because like, Again, like when we saw with like Barack Obama, yeah, there's a lot of people that got out and wanted to go vote for him, you know, the hope and change candidate, not against John McCain, not against Mitt Romney. It's just that right now, the Republicans have such a good equation, um, such a good marketing scheme campaign to go against why you shouldn't vote for the other person and why like total scare tactics, you know. So they can't really run on anything. They just run against the other party. And I hate to say it, they have been very successful up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, granted, you know, we've seen them kind of lose, you know, the House representatives back in, what was it, 2018? We saw them, you know, everything kind of leveled off in 2020 where they lost the Senate, lost, you know, the presidency. But it's still very thin. We don't know how this referendum is going to play out here in 2022. A lot of times that referendum is going to be done on the party in power, which is the Democrats. So I know the Democrats are trying very, very hard to, you know, this is what we stand for. This is what we're running on. The Republicans are still going back to their same old playbook. This is what we're running against. You know, we're running against this. We're running against this. We're running against this. So to people in the so, chat, to people in the chat who are saying or like moaning at me for the Republican comment, I'm not saying we shouldn't want Republicans to vote for us. I'm saying statistically we don't need them to to win elections. So well, stop moaning, disagree. everybody. But it's well, just, it's just true. You, Look at polling on it. Any issue, no. well, the country is more I, liberal than they are conservative. What, yeah, I know what you're t saying, and I know the, the math that you're talking about, but don't forget a lot of these states are gerrymandered, like even like your state of Texas. There is a growing and growing Democratic population there. No, I got how the you. The maps but are being designed, or you know, against Democrats. My so, point is, at least for the next decade or two I, decades, I, it's going to be a, an uphill battle. Yes, I think we're going to, with a good progressive movement. I don't know to anyone who watched my show. You know that I reach out all the darn time to more conservative people, and I always try to put things in, in phrasing that they would uh, appreciate and stuff like that. And so it's not that I don't want to convince people, because obviously that's amazing. I want everyone to hold the opinions or not the exact opinions, but hold the uh, broader values that I hold, of course. And so I think we should be trying to convince Republicans. I just don't think we have to change our policy prescriptions uh, to appeal to them, because if we just try to be more conservative, they'll just vote for the conservative candidate. I never understood that. You have to, uh, you can be radically different than the other candidate. You should have to propose something that people are um, excited about. And we've seen, while this doesn't translate into... Uh, like support for an individual, actually even conservative voters like a lot of progressive policies. And so now it's about how do we attach those progressive policies to an, an individual that's really good at uh, appealing to a broader audience, which I think you and exactly. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you need a moderate to do that. Cause you're not going to have these far left, you know, radical Democrats going out there and, you know, making the case to the people in Marjorie Taylor Greene's districts, you know, you're going to need to have that but middle But that's my point. Candidate. You don't need to get someone who supports Marjorie Taylor DeGreen to vote for you. At, at most, you just need to appeal to the more moderate Republicans. Someone who's a Marjorie Taylor Greene stan, I promise you, is never going to vote for even a moderate Democrat. They think moderate Democrats are literally... Hillary, to me, is a moderate Democrat, and they thought that she was running a sex trafficking ring. Like, I'm not concerned with their opinion on... <laughs> Well, that. you have to understand, yeah, these people are, you know, they have been misled for a very, very long time. But moderate Republicans we and, can get to, I think. Well, yeah, well, like, you have to be able to approach these conversations in a way that they'll listen, you know, that they'll understand. Because I mean, a lot of the times when you come right off the bat, like, oh, I'm a Democratic Socialist, these guys are going to turn their ears right Agreed. off. They're not yeah. going to listen to a word that you say. So you have to come at it from a center line, a center perspective for these people to even be able to give you the time of day 
to even attract, you know, obviously I compete for the independents, but if you're competing for like those, you know, eh, kind of like center of the road Republicans, then yeah, you're going to get the Democrats too. So that's what you need to aim for. Kind of, you know, shoot for the, shoot for the moon. If you miss, you land among the stars kind of thing, you know, try to get a little bit more than what you're aiming for. But, but I guess here's to me, uh, I, I agree with you whenever we don't get into the specifics like if you say i think a moderate candidate would do well and they should appeal blah, 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 i agree with all that but then a lot of times what at least um establishment democrats mean by that is like that's why we need someone like joe manchin or kirsten cinema or uh, well, no or that's no, why we no. need people like amy klobuchar or something and to me it's like you have to be moderate but actually well, moderate you need someone with character but, yeah like moderate on like moderate is supporting universal health care. Universal health care is insanely popular. Moderate is supporting a, you know, whatever, minimum wage or something. Like those oh, are all, the, I, it's just the presentation I, I, that people well, think I, is not okay, moderate. I know you keep saying that, yeah, it's very popular, but then why don't, you know, these candidates win when they run on it? They don't. Because people don't like, vote just based on policy. It, well, yes, but yeah, you know, like there's a lot that plays into it, but you know, it's a style like we're kind of talking about here. You know, yeah, you can have those views, like, you know, and, you know, have, like, that goal in mind, but it's about how you approach it. Like, how do you market it? How do you, like, approach the voters to, like, explain, you know, how this will be beneficial to them and then win them and to get them on your side? That's why we need someone like a Pete Buttigieg, someone who can go out there, speak very clearly, someone who does not feel like they're being overly dramatic when they talk, you know? He's with, my boy. I love him. I, he's Pete, always been. He's definitely like <laughs> insanely politically uh, talented. So good at speaking. I saw some video of him recently talking about the uh, Roe v. Wade stuff, and he was just, just the mm, words were just rolling off his tongue so nicely. And I agree that he comes off as like level headed and super intelligent and all those things. Uh, I think and the main concern. There's, in my opinion, there's but yeah. two main concerns with him. One, um. He's gay. <laughs> okay. Two, uh, he is, and to anyone who's new, the person on the phone is gay and I'm gay. So this is not just throwing shade. This is just political realities. Um, I think he also doesn't have like any experience really, except for well, being a mayor. You know? Does he though? Like, yeah, like he was the mayor of South Bend. He ran a national campaign that was relatively successful. Now he's, you know, the transportation secretary. Like, what kind of experience are you looking for? Donald Trump, you know, obviously was, you know, a businessman and never had any political experience when he became president. You can look at, you know, a lot of other presidents throughout history. You know, Ronald Reagan was, you know, an actor before he became governor of California. Like, so I don't really buy that, especially right now when everyone's so anti-establishment. Like, well, no, no, no. Here's, hey, here's let me put know. this here. Like, I think someone could run with no political political experience and do really well. But I think if you market yourself as the Harvard graduate, the level-headed, that the type of people who like that, like someone with some experience, that's like a Biden voter. I want like that's why Pete is a good follow-up to Biden. Um, what I'm bummed about, I don't know. I don't know what he could have ran for, but if he had failed his presidential race and then, and like you said, he did really well and then ran for Senate or something, which he can't cause he's in Indiana, which he would lose. But then he would just be the most ideal candidate ever. Now I'm curious. I know, I feel like, you know, gay marriage is really popular now in the United States, but, but like, I'm super curious how much of a role that plays. Cause we've seen like really, good uh female candidates but they just can't break through because there's still a lot of kind of underlying uh biases i think that people are like oh president it looks like a man and i'm curious if it's the same thing with a gay candidate it's like uh i don't know they don't have like their wife next to them and I'm, i'm so fascinated but he did do really well in the democratic primary so that's good yeah like and again you know like these things do have their their way of playing themselves out like i want to say the last schools in the country got integrated in like 1989 like i know my schools in alabama got integrated super super late and then like 20 something years later we have a black president you know so it's and of course you know when you look at you know the history of the world or the history of the united states you know black men got the right to vote before women 
So then maybe it's next in line for a woman to become president. And then after that, we can start talking about maybe a gay man becoming president or a lesbian becoming president. But at the same time, like, I want to say, who cares? You know, like, well, no, you know, if, I believe that. It's yeah, like, yeah, why I, the heck I know. do people care we, about we that? We all believe this, but there's a lot of, you know, very conservative Christian type voters out there that, you know, will look at this and be like, hey, I don't actually, you know, I can't support this man for president. But yet they turn around and support Donald Trump, you know, for for the presidency, even though he had his fair share of, you know, infidelities and rape accusations. Oh, my gosh. But, don't get me started on the uh, I, I selective wait, wait. the selective interest of many people with yeah. the bible certain yeah, verses I they want to judge like, hard yeah, yeah. certain verses they do not care about <laughs> oh yeah well you, you and me both we're both we both consider ourselves christians and we both have been probably on the you know the other side of the table with someone telling us that we're going to hell for being gay but you know that's a good one i love that. yeah it's just yeah there's just a lot of things that this world is still trying to figure itself out with people are still Again, some people in the country are living 50 years behind us, you know, like me and you have lived a very, you know, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? A very, you know, experience filled oh. life. You know, we have, we've had a lot of different experiences living on Los Angeles, you know, mm. but there's people in Alabama who are still living, you know, in Texas, probably 50 years behind us. So that's oh, why it's also saying. kind of important to keep that in mind when we're talking about, you know, un un universal health care, these super liberal policies. There's so many pockets of the country that are not up to date with this. They're still living, you know, decades behind us and we're mm -hmm. waiting for them to catch up. But we can't sit here and just feel like get mad at them for not being where we're at, being as progressive as we are, being as modern as we are. We have to kind of look back and, you know, put ourselves in their shoes and be like, hey, how did the Democrat talk to these people, you know, so many years ago? You know, yeah. this it's kind of we have to go kind of tone ourselves down, go back to like the moderate, you know, talking points, even reach out to some of these voters. Cause I honestly believe, well, well honestly like 60% of the country supports gay marriage, you know, like it's becoming more and more and more popular. People are coming around to it. People are becoming more liberal. It's just that we can't be scaring people off because people get scared about things they don't understand, people, things that they don't know about. And people don't know about you know, universal health care. They just hear what, you know, Tucker Carlson said on Fox News, and then they run the opposite direction. They think Democrats are out to get them, and that's just not the point. But then again, Democrats are not giving themselves any, you know, leeway, because you have the Bernies going out there, the Elizabeth Warrens, the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is going out there. And I'm not going to lie, being a little bit dramatic about some of these policy positions, and that just kind of scares people even more. And then it just allows... The Republicans just to brand, hey, this is look at these crazy Democrats, you know. When there's plenty of moderates out there, granted, I don't believe like Joe Manchin's the kind of moderate I'm talking about. That dude's just a Republican and you know, and you know, a Democrat's clothing. Mm -hmm. He has no business being a Democrat at all at this point, but mm -hmm. you know, okay, I, I'm kind of rambling, but I think, <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I, I do think AOC has had some moments where she allowed herself to possibly be branded a certain kind of way, but either way they're going to attack her a lot. Um, and same thing with Bernie, but with Bernie, I definitely don't think if he would have dropped some of the labels he used, like, I don't think he should say socialist anywhere in his name. Um, his actual policies I think were popular. I think he could have said, Hey, I'm a moderate. What are you talking about? Well, do you think this is radical? Do you think this is radical? Because a lot of times they don't actually tell you what makes you radical. They just say you're radical because mm -hmm. you're quote unquote far left. Um, but I agree a successful candidate kind of does have to have that branding of um, someone who could bring together all different groups of people. And um, I probably disagree with you on how hyperbolic they're being. Like, I don't, I don't think the more far left people are being that hyperbolic about the policies, but um, I generally agree with your prescription. So there yeah. we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to add one last thing to that, then we can move on to something else. But like when we talk about capitalism, right, and socialism, mm -hmm. there is a great sense of patriotism associated with the word capitalism. Granted, if you believe it or not, there's like a huge part of our history that's been dedicated to capitalism, free market societies, you know, freedom. So it's very mm -hmm. hard when people talk about socialism and that type of a tran transition. Because even then, you know, a lot of economists out there, they'll tell you they believe in a mixed economy, part socialism, part free market, and have like a mixed economy. Use the best of both worlds, yeah. not solely socialist, not solely free market, because there's a lot of, you know, 
margins of error there. But that's the thing. Like people get so dug into these labels where it can be so destructive, where it's like black or white. You have to be capitalistic. You have to be socialist. You know, you have to be patriotic or, you know, you're not a patriot. Kind well, of that's thing. what cracks me up about um, so many people who call like everything that the, the Democrats want to do socialist, because I'm like, you do realize all programs from your definition that you enjoy in this country are socialist programs and like you're saying we do live in a mixed economy and i don't think really anybody serious believes that we should have absolutely zero government intervention so the second that you say yes there should be some government intervention slash regulation slash government programs uh within the economy then we all agree okay we we're gonna live within a mixed economy and, and if that's the case it's just how mixed you know in which direction do we want it to be and which areas do we think are uh that which areas do we think that markets free markets don't succeed at and uh require a government intervention and that's why i think a lot of times it comes down to the elastic inelastic demand thing where um like healthcare or I should start with the elastic. Most markets have elastic demand. So if you raise a price, the demand goes down. And that's what causes companies to have an incentivization to uh, bring down prices and give us, you know, affordable products. But then in industries like healthcare, where you, the example I always give is insulin. That's called an inelastic, um, inelastic demand applies to insulin because regardless of how high they jack up the prices you're still gonna buy it no matter what your yeah. the demand is not gonna go down because they raise prices um and especially when they've monopolized that particular industry so that's a great example of the free market fails there because of this inelastic demand so government should step in but then with shoes like i think everyone should have shoes but the free market takes care of it so we don't need the government to step in and uh you know run all the shoe places so I don't know if everyone thought about it that way it would be less of a stinger to be like you're a socialist but because people think they they're living in a fully capitalist society right now uh it sounds like you're saying oh you want to be like china or you want to be uh the ussr you want to be venezuela or whatever and that's really all people know they just know that's bad <laughs> and so then they yeah. don't yeah and i think out. it's great to like you know take that kind of type of an approach to these type these kind of conversations because i think people forget at the end of the day we're not Democrats. We're not Republicans. We're Americans. We're all here together. We're one big, happy American family. We need to stop labeling each other, you know, in these types of ways just because it becomes so divisive and it makes it so difficult to get things done, you know. And so I would like to see, you know, the next Democratic Republican candidate that runs for president probably take that more neutral approach, you know, hey, we're all Americans. We're not Democrats, you know, we're not socialists and and capitalists we're all americans we're all here trying to do the common good we just have different ways of going about it you know yeah I so think, you know rhetorically yeah. biden definitely did that he was like i'm not a democratic president i'm a american person or whatever <laughs> 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 which i think you know eh, whatever <laughs> i do agree like we gotta turn on the temperature but i just don't know exactly the the best way to me is that we provide a movement that does really good things for people um, yeah. and, <laughs> and sorry, I'm going to finish this and then I got to read a question someone asked. Uh, and then people see, wow, the democratic party part promised stuff and they followed through. But right now you can have all the unifying rhetoric you want, but then you get in office and don't follow through and people get really pissed. Uh, but Jared said, Hey Nate, does he ever let you talk? <laughs> no guys, Nate is not a politics junkie. He got really mad because I would come over and, uh, me and Austin would ramble and ramble and ramble about politics and <laughs> they would be like, ugh. So annoying. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. It looks like uh, Nate needs you to go eat. I guess you're having a round two dinner. So enjoy oh. that. Oh, and what a bummer. You're kicking me off, huh, Luke? Okay. I'm, I'm kicking you <laughs> off. That was just a good po stopping point, and he said five minutes. So I was like, I don't want to be in the middle All of something. Right. Sure thing. All right, Luke. I'll talk to you soon. Let's do that again. Oh, night. my gosh. You could, anytime I'm streaming, oh, yeah. just message Which, me. I just... Yeah, I'm just sitting in my room right now, just chatting away. So whenever you're ready, just, you know, let me know. Oh, sweet. That'll be so fun. All right. Well, have a good rest of your night. All right. Bye, Luke. Bye.